Yeah, yes, I do. Yes, yeah, I do know. Yeah. No, I'm miss, missing the name. No, I, I had a chat here last week. Number of guests duly introduced by fellows beg leave to attend your meeting. Is it your pleasure that I welcome them in your name? Thank you. Minutes. The minutes of the ordinary meeting of the Society of Antiquaries of London held on Thursday, 6th of April 2023. Professor Martin Millett, President and the Chair. The minutes of the ordinary meeting of Thursday, 30th of March 2023, were read and signed. The following being in attendance and having signed the obligation required by the statutes was duly admitted fellow, Edward Cousins. The following communication was then laid before the Society. Rendlesham Reveal, investigating an early East Anglian royal centre by Professor Chris Skull, FSA. Thanks were returned for this communication. President announced the next meeting would be on Thursday, 13th of April, 2023, then adjourned the meeting. A reception followed. Is it your pleasure that I sign these minutes as a true and complete record? Thank you. Um, our main business this evening is to here a paper. Um, we are grateful to our Tony Brown fellow for uh, attending this evening to present the paper. Um, Tony is a geoarchaeologist and environmental archaeologist with particular interests in environmental change, paleoecology, ancient DNA, and human environment interactions. I think his um, work is well known to many in the room. He directs the Paleoecology Centre at the University of Southampton and also holds a chair in the University Museum in Tronso, Norway, where he is co-director of the Aurora Centre for Arctic Ecosystems and Genomics. His paper this evening is uh, the SEDA DNA Revolution in Archaeology, question mark, current progress and future potential. Welcome, Tony. Right. Well, it's very nice to be here. I don't think I've actually been here looking since 2007, which has seemed a very long time ago. But anyway, in fact, it was before I had ever really discovered SEDA DNA as well. But uh, I used to do pollen and things like that. But pollen will, is still around and we will refer to it. Right. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the teams that have been doing this, because all this work is teamwork. I mean, you couldn't do this kind of work on your own. So, and I'll say a bit about that and some of the projects that it comes from. But I want to try to give you an overview, really, of what SEDA DNA can be used for. So I'll start off by saying what it is and a little bit about what's called authentication. This is a very important element. Uh, I won't spend lots of time on methods because um, that's just recipe chemistry, really, and it's a bit boring. So uh, I want to get on, really, to the ways that it can be used uh, and is being used. And so I'll deal with 
uh, the middle part is our standard sites, the sites that we like and that we've done most work on. And then at the end, I'll talk about the more experimental sites um, in some states, in some ways, slightly more archaeological. It's all archaeology, though, in my view, uh, but where DNA is uh, in many ways more problematic, but has possibly even greater potential. Right. Uh, first of all, there are two forms of DNA. Um, simply put, there is the DNA that's in you at the moment, which is in your cells uh, and in bones. And that's the DNA that was first used in archaeology, which was from bone DNA. And that's what we would call intracellular DNA. Then there is DNA which is actually resting on the surface of your skin, which is not actually contained within cells. And that's extracellular DNA. And it's that type of DNA which is, uh, adheres to clays and to soil particles and sediment particles that I'm going to really concentrate on because that's what um, is called environmental DNA and it's environmental DNA which I'm going to be using for archeology. span um, There's a graph there of, of the uh, papers published in using what's called SEDA or SED DNA. And you can see it's increasing very dramatically. You can see it doesn't go far back either to 2000, there's, there's one. Uh, but in fact, if you took the next two years on, uh, you would see it about three times as high as that, if not more than that. So it's actually now getting to an exponential point of increase. I will be taking examples from all over the place, but you can see from this uh, map here where the stars are, those are the sites that I'll be actually mentioning. It did start off in the cold regions, and there's a sort of a logical reason for that, this kind of work. Um, but, uh, and the in blue, in the blue box, those are all the studies. Uh, that's pretty well all the studies that use set of DNA in archaeology that exist. So it's still not that many. Um, and on the top other insets are project which is very important to the way we work, a project called Ecogen. And then the top right is a project called Terrace, which is the sort of most recent project that I will be referring to. So you can see that there is a pretty strong concentration to Scandinavia, Britain, uh, a little bit into the Mediterranean, and a little bit also uh, in North America and Greenland as well, and Siberia. How old can SEDA DNA be? How old can the, the DNA in sediment be? Well, if I was giving this this time last year, I'd have said 1.1 million years because there's a site, a mammoth site, where the DNA was extracted from the sediment from St. Paul's Island uh, in, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, however, that's not correct because uh, there was a paper published uh, last year, later last year in Nature uh, from a site called Cap Copenhagen, which is from the northern tip of right at the top of Greenland. So it's pretty cold but it's an interglacial, it's a warm site, and it has DNA which is 2.1 million years old. And it's got, interestingly enough, it's got things we recognize. Uh, most of the plants are alive today, in fact, nearly all of them, bar one. And uh, most, not all the animals, it's the, some of the large herbivores have of course gone extinct, but the reindeer is there. Um, so that's been around for a long time. Uh, so that technically means that under the right circumstances, DNA can at least last for the whole of the Pleistocene. And that's pretty well all that archaeologists really need. You don't need any more than that. Anything more is Jurassic Park, which we won't refer to. Currently, the oldest DNA that I'm aware of in, that's been extracted in the UK is by us, and we've got some from the Lake Glacial. We have been sampling interglacial sites, archaeological sites, but we have yet to get any authenticated DNA from them. Doesn't mean to say we won't, we probably will, but not yet, I haven't done so yet. Right. Intracellular DNA uh, is released when cells decay. So when, uh, when lysis occurs, so the cell wall breaks, DNA is released into the environment. And unless it's trapped by something, unless it attaches to a particle, such as a clay particle, clay mineral particle, or an organic compound, it will be gobbled up and it will be eaten into bits by microorganisms. So only the DNA that is then bound onto particles is retained within the sediment. And then if it's buried, 
it therefore can, in theory, under the right circumstances, be left there for at least 2.1 million years. Now, there are two methods of, the only thing I'll say about methods there are, is that basically there are two methods. There is the method which was used first in archaeology, which is called shotgun sequencing. And in that method, you extract the DNA and you just sequence whatever you have in there. 99% of it will be bacteria. So it is like hunting for a needle in a haystack. So that's the shotgun sequencing, but you get DNA of all the fragment lengths. So DNA might be, the minimum it could be is two base pairs really, but it could be as many as 150 base pairs. But if it's shotgun sequencing, it could be more than that. There is actually a sort of limit to do with sequences. But. And then you have a, a massive puzzle job trying to put all these sequences, align them to get out a list of species. So in fact, ironically, shotgun sequencing is not as accurate as the other method, which I'll mention in a minute, which is called metabarcoding because it doesn't go to such a high taxonomic level. So the second method, which is the method that most of the examples, not all, but most of the examples I will show is what's called metabarcoding. And metabarcoding uh, is where we extract the DNA, we then add up something called a primer, which is tailored to only attach to certain types of DNA. And we use a primer that attaches particularly to something called the P6 loop, which is part of the chloroplast of plants. So you can see by that, we will get plants, vascular plants, we'll get algae, but we won't get fungi because they're not, they don't photosynthesize. We won't get lichens really as well too. So the primer that you use in theory controls what you get. You sometimes get what's called bycatch as well. And I will show you some examples of that. And then what you get is these sequences. So the sequences vary, and there you are, you can see they're conform, composed, of course, as you can see, of you're just the, the four bases, C, G, A, T, uh, in repetitive order. And uh, that top is eel, and you can see the eel one is rather long. Uh, this is not using P6 loop, this is using 12S or um, 16S. Uh, but you can see that, for example, down the bottom, those bottom ones in brown, they're all worms. Worms are identifiable to the species level with relatively short sequences, which is one of the reasons we get an awful lot of worms, although neither 12S nor 16S is designed for worms. That's what's called bycatch. So you can see that we get those are the, the sequences, uh, and that's from metabarcoding. So what we need to do, of course, is we need to match those sequences to a database. And one of the reasons that I, I moved to Norway is that uh, in the museum, we have a herbarium and we sequenced all of the base, nearly all the Arctic plants, um, circumpolar plants have been sequenced. Well, not quite fully, they're not fully sequenced, they're genome skimmed. And that has provided us with something called Philo Norway. And that's the database to which we can match our sequences. Okay. There are two plant databases in the world at the moment. One for Northern Scandinavia, covers most of Britain though, and one for the Alps. If you're outside those areas, you are not, you might only get 70 or 80% match. If you're inside those areas, you should be able to get a match of about 96, 97 or more percent uh, to species level, with some exceptions, which are species that share chloroplast DNA. So, saying it's held. It's, it's, it's held by particles. Well, this is an example from an archeological site. It's sediments of a Cranach from Northern Ireland. And you can see here on the, your, your right, this, this is the plants and those are the animals, those are the domesticated animals. And we think basically we know that the, the DNA for the animals and the plants are held in different ways. So the plants, which is this lot here, they're held on the green bits there, which are mostly clays within the sediment. And that's why they're, they're, they're all the way through the sediment, they're held on the clays. But if you take the domesticated animals, such as, you know, you've got horse and uh, pig and uh, cattle and sheep there, we find that we get high levels, these high levels of them, only when uh, we had these micro shards of 
calcite, which really means micro shards of bone. And the reason for that is that there was slaughtering going on on the Cranach and little microscopic bits of, of bone came off the Cranach. So technically this is both intracellular DNA and extracellular DNA, but that is only extracellular DNA. It turns out that the mechanisms of, of the processes involved with, with animal DNA are not the same as the processes involved in plant DNA, not completely. So that's, that's how we, we know. And, and we know this from using something called ChemScan, which is a, uh, an automated system of, of looking at the mineralogy of sediments. So now this question about authentication. The first time that anybody extracted DNA from sediment, someone said to us, but how do you know it's old? Why not? It could be the DNA, could be the DNA that there's contamination. It could be just contamination. So there's whole, obviously it's very important and more important in archeology span to authenticate than it is probably in, in other areas such as climate research and, and even ecology. Now there are two methods. One is what's called extrinsic authentication and the other is intrinsic authentication. Extrinsic is where we authenticate it by reference to a, a known event, such as an introduction or an extinction. So if I get DNA from some sediment out here in Trafalgar Square, for example, and I find an extinct species, which I would do actually in Trafalgar Square, which is why I picked it, and that species uh, such as the mammoth or whatever is extinct, well, then obviously it's got to be old, the DNA, because we have a lot of mammoths around today. So you can't really contaminate with it. However, that's obviously not the case. Normally, we don't deal with extinct species mostly in most of archaeology. But if you look at this example, which is from a beautiful uh, lake in, in Ireland that I will come back to, Loch Catherine in Northern Ireland, you can see that up at the top there, in that top sample, we have all sorts of things. We've got sweet chestnut, we've got beech, we've got lime. Um, well, those aren't native. None of those are native to Ireland. So this lot up here all reflects the landscaping of those gardens around Baron's Court House. And they don't occur down here a little bit, so we have to be careful, a little bit here and here. You have to think of what that's, but that's old Macy, and there are other things that can come into that. So we can do it that way. And so we can see the landscaping of the gardens, and that's an, that's an extrinsic authentication. Better than that, we know that Sika deer were introduced into Barons Court Estate in, in between 1860 and 1870. And our estimate from the Sika deer appearance in the core is 1840. Uh, I think that's a reasonable, reasonably good. If we can get that close, that actually really depends on our age depth model. So this is the, the that's called extrinsic authentication. And that's what we mostly use because it's cheaper and intrinsic authentication. This is uh, an age depth curve for uh, actually the same lake. There's the zero, that's the top of the sediment, that's the bottom of the sediment. So there's, it's a nice age depth curve. It's a very nice lake, that's why we use it a lot. And this is the damage pattern of the DNA. Now, as, if, as DNA gets older, its ends get frayed and there are swaps between C and T and A and G. And that produces this tick up here. You see this rise in the red curve there and there. And it seems that the older the DNA is, the more this happens. It's, it's not a simple function of time, otherwise we'd have a new dating method and we don't, but it certainly can be used to authenticate. So for example, as we shift, that's virtually no damage, that's zero, you can see zero there, and that's 0.5 damage. That means half the DNA is basically damaged. And you can see that the average damage pattern increases as we go. Now that's for plants, nice and regular, bit of a mess for animals. And there are reasons to do with the spotty occurrence of native species. So they're very difficult. One of these in here is a bat. Largely it's thousands and thousands of reeds of a bat that just happened to fall in the lake, which is interesting if you're into bats, but not very helpful to us. Right, now I'm just going to look at some of the examples. So that's, that's what it is. We started this work up in, start work started largely in Scandinavia. And this is the Ecogen project, and this is 10 lakes. And what we're looking at here is the colonization of both uh, of, uh, of Northern, uh, Northern Europe and Scandinavia after the ice. So the ice departed about here, 
And we're seeing basically all of these species, these are actually growth forms, so dwarf uh, shrubs and herbs and trees. And this is the background to human colonization because that's when humans arrive up here in the north, quite early actually. They come both from east and west, rather interestingly. So this is what uses our database, our Philo Alps database. Uh, and uh, we can also apply this to individual archeological sites. So this is one of the, the, probably the biggest site in the Arctic archeological site on the Varanga Peninsula at Morton's Ness. So it's way up in, way up in the north up, up here. Uh, it's got several areas and it's occupied almost semi-continuously by different cultural or different groups over the last 10,000 years. And you can see here, um, that's a temperature curve, uh, and this is uh, fish from other data. We also have some excavated houses, and these pie charts here have the species on them from the excavations, and that corresponds with these phases of house building. This is all to do with the fact that this whole site basically is elevated further and further above sea level as the sea level falls, because of course this is northern Scandinavia, and they're taking the ice off means that Northern Peniscandia basically slowly goes up and up and up. And that's how it's actually dated, just like the rock art in Alta, which is not very far away. And then this are the species, are sort of the species that we see in the DNA. But this is all the, the mammals. And this is at the moment the site which has produced most mammals of any site that's, that's had DNA work. And there are 48 different mammals, or animals there rather. You can see here that this top lot, which includes whales and jellyfishes, that's all marine. And then early Holocene, you lose the marine and you have all the terrestrial here from birds and, uh, and some fish, but mostly birds and uh, uh, um, mammals. Um, and uh, that's what we exclude. That's the red because that's contamination. And two really nice proofs, if you like. This is beaver, all right, European beaver. That's when it is in the DNA. And there it is in the house, and it dates the same period. So we get it on the, in the house in the archaeology, and then we get it in the lake as well at the same period. That suggests that it was particularly dense, the population around that time. I think we all know why it didn't remain so. Um, the other thing you can see here is this uh, spotty occurrence here of reindeer. We've had a bit of a problem with reindeer, and yet we get more money to research on reindeer than anything else, being in Scandinavia. So we've got to work on reindeer all the time, really. Uh, it's a political matter. Anyway, the last thousand years, we get continuous reindeer. Now, I think that's to do with the development of, of herding of reindeer, but that is a massive politically dodgy area, which we will not go any further into, and that's enough of it. We are now doing the same thing in the Alps because I mentioned that we also have a full database called Philo Alps. And here we have 14 lakes, mostly at the tree limit because that's the most sensitive part. And we're interested then actually in high level archeology span in most of these sites. And here's one of them. This is Sorsal Selvali, who can't pronounce it, um, in the Bernese Highlands. And you can see here, we have, we have our DNA of ibex, chamois, red deer, sheep, cow, goat. We have a lot of plant DNA, which I won't discuss, but then also you can see we do use traditional methods such as coprophyllous spores. And you can see there's a reasonable uh, correspondence between the coprophyllous spores and the domesticates which come in over the 4, 000, last 4,000 years. This has the most vascular plants actually of any site. This has 366 uh, plant taxa detected. Now, the average for pollen, oh, as it says there, it's, it's a very good pollen site. It has 173, but you can see that we're uh, over doubling, dub doubling that. All right, so uh, we're now doing the same in, in, in the Alps. Back to good old Northern Ireland, uh, a, a site which has been studied for a long time. Um, the core that we have extends back into the Neolithic, and there are two elite or royal sites on Loch Catherine, uh, Island McHugh and Lislear. Um, wrath. So, and really there are no other sites. So what we see is reflecting the activity on those sites. So we can see here, not from DNA, but from uh, mineralogy, uh, that's titanium, uh, the site construction, phases of site construction on, this is Island McHugh. We can see uh, forest clearance due to the reduction, the reduction in trees here, you can see those trees are reducing, 
and an increase in open canopy or grassland species. It's just like a pollen diagram in, 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 in the way we interpret it really. Um, but then you see the cultivation uh, and here we have, we have less problem going to species level than you have going than, than you have with pollen. Um, and then at the very top, as I mentioned, you have the plantation and the establishment of the landscape gardens. Uh, and here, most interestingly, of course, is that from the same sample, we also get the domesticated and very strongly domesticated. This is the domesticated stock. These are the mammals here. And you can see they start in the, well, they start in the Neolithic, but kick off into the Bronze and the Iron Age. And then really there's a bit of a gap. And then they really start again in the early to main uh, full medieval period. We also use a couple of other molecular methods. We've been using fecal stanols quite a bit. Uh, one of the reasons for that was that theoretically someone said, well, yes, but couldn't your DNA be coming from dead animals? And so we said, well, yes, it's sort of theoretically possible, although they'd have to be sort of continuously dead. They'd have to be sort of dying repeatedly for that to be the case. But we thought, well, okay, well, we'll look at fecal stanols because they can only be produced by animals that are alive, such as humans as well as domesticates. And you can see that's the, that's the we have very strong fecal stanols here because we're very close to the archeological site on Island McHugh. And then we can do a bit of modeling. So if we model this red line here is a, a what's called a site occupancy model. This has been done by one of our collaborators, Fichitola. And uh, you can see that it's a sort of Bayesian model. It basically says, well, here we've got a 100% likelihood of them being, animal being present here is zero. And you can see that, for example, our goat does not come up to the criteria that this model uses. So we can't definitely say that there is goat there, although we have goat DNA. So this is one of the ways that we're trying to sort of filter the data to make it more robust. Um, so we have direct uh, evidence of human activity and fecal matter from 600 BC onwards. Now, we have also looked, we're starting to look now at the Neolithic in, in England. This is a, a, a site from Suffolk. It's a paleo channel. This is not a lake. As you can see, it's basically, it would have been muddy pond. And that does present potentially more difficulties. But what we, reason I'm showing to you here is that we have, uh, we have a drop in elm. And this is the elm decline, which I'm sure some of you have heard of ad nauseam probably, uh, at a major event of the Neolithic. Um, we won't go into its full set of causes, but there it is at the right, at the right level, it's the right age, 5,300, it's the right age. Uh, and uh, you can see a nice full set of, again, very rich, uh, a re very rich site in terms of the plants present. And interestingly enough, it is associated with domesticates, with domesticated cattle. Now, we weren't looking for domesticates here. I really wanted Bos primogenius. That's the aurochs, because an aurochs was found at this site, a lovely big horn core of an aurochs. But we didn't get that. We didn't get any aurochs. And we, we can recognize it, so we really wanted it. But we didn't get it. Instead, we got boring old normal cow and sheep and a bit of goat. And uh, therefore, we thought, well, perhaps this is contamination. So perhaps we can write it off because it's contamination. We don't need to. And we can go on hunting for, for the aurochs. It isn't contamination, though, because this is the damage patterns. This is the cattle. So it's Bos, Bos taurus, basically introduced from the, from the Taurus Mountains, from uh, eastern Mediterranean or a bit eastern that. And here it is. There's the damage patterns there. And just to check with a plant, uh, and also because we have difficulty differentiating within the Betulaceae. Um, between hazel and birch, but we so we we this also was useful for that reason. Um, and uh, there it is on the hazel as well. So that DNA is ancient. So it is the original excavators thought there was a trackway. Uh, they've now decided they don't think there's a trackway, but there is certainly evidence of human occupation and use of that part of the woodland at the edge of the floodplain, uh, probably near some 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 cleared land which was being farmed. Moving later, things go absolutely wild in the medieval period. This is uh, a site from the West Midlands, not far from Shropshire. And uh, there are over 250 plant taxa here. We're not going to spend much time. This is massive data because there are millions of reeds involved in each of the points on this diagram. But a couple of things that are very, very interesting. It's a, it's a small uh, Shropshire mere next actually to an Iron Age hill fort. 
And if you look here, oh, you may just see, I hope you can see my pointer, that's Juglans, that's walnut. Now we know quite a bit about walnut. Walnut is introduced by the Romans. Uh, here, that's the uh, Romano-British level is there. It doesn't appear at the Roman. It's also found, in fact, the nearest site it's found at is, is Roxeter, which is only a few miles away. It's not far from Roxeter. Um, so walnut is at Roxeter. Um, and then you can see it starts on what we think is the early medieval period. We're having big problems dating, getting, we have a good age depth model, but it's quite compressed over the early to the main medieval. So at the moment, we are still refining the age depth model. But if we look at some of the other cultivars, we can see that we're, we're in a different world from pollinators. We're, it's like a massive step up. So we've got things like oats, we've got uh, cannabis, phagopyrum, that's buckwheat, Roman introduction. Look, um, and you can see it's, it's these are um, amazing histories of all of these cultivars that you couldn't get, we couldn't possibly get from pollen. So that is really just part of the, the future. This site also, um, this site also has a fantastic mammal record, which I've not shown you <laughs> for various reasons. Um, and everything is right. The beaver disappears, the fish appear uh, in the, uh, in the Romano-British period. Uh, and, uh, and everything is right, except that we have brown rat too early and we have yet to resolve this. So that's a, an interesting, that's why I'm not showing it to you. But we've also been looking at islands. Islands are very interesting because I like islands because they're a bit bounded. Uh, theoretically, I'm interested in what makes an island sustainable over particularly the medieval and post-medieval period. And so this is uh, the Irish, the islands around the, the Sea of Moyle, which is the Southern Hebrides, and a couple of islands off North, Northern Ireland, off Ireland rather, which is Torrey and, uh, and Rathlin. From the most successful island, which is Isla, uh, a, a major grain producing island uh, in the medieval period, uh, very much favored by a lot of different groups of peoples over the years, from the Gal, from the Dalradia, through to the Vikings, through to the early, through to the Christian uh, period. Uh, 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 very, uh, and of course, um, uh, even when grain, uh, grain wasn't sold as grain, and you know, after the potato famine, of course, it started another industry for which we will always be eternally grateful. Uh, there are 11 distilleries on, on uh, Isla, as I'm sure you know. Anyway, one of the classic sites is Finlagen. And here we can actually, so we can probably date the, we can probably date the core better from the DNA than we can from the radiocarbon, which is a slight problem. And that will increasingly become the problem. So for example, let's just have a look here. We've got our plantation. We know it was planted around the site, actually where, behind where the picture is. And it was planted in 1986. And there's the plantation at the top, as you expect. Then that's potato. So again, that start can't be before about 1740. And then it isn't after, and that date roughly corresponds with about 1855, 1856. That's the potato famine. And it wipes it out. And from then on, you just have grazing land and also some, some, a little bit of, uh, uh, a little bit of, of uh, cultivation as well, but mostly just grazing land around the, me the, the medieval palace that is Finlagen itself, which of course was the seat of the Lords of the Isles until the 15th century. Uh, this, is, this is the corresponding period actually for the Lordship of the Isles, and it doesn't entirely fit with the known history of the site, so this has yet to be resolved. So our, our, our history, our record that we get here from all these cultivation, all these uh, oats and, and, and barley, uh, doesn't always quite fit with the known archaeology. So that throws up some interesting and important questions for excavation or and, and, and maybe in some cases future excavation. And in fact, in Ireland, we led partly, we, we started an excavation for this region uh, on, on Island McHugh. Not all sites are easy. Uh, and this is the other site I'm very interested in out of the Sea of Moyle. This is the island of, of Torrey Island. It's the last remaining example of what is called Rundale the Rundale tenurial system. Here it is, there's the Rundale fields. Basically, it was all covered by agriculture in the Bronze Age. And then at some point, most of the island or about two thirds was stripped off and basically placed into these field systems. It's a very interesting system. And in fact, it's also sustainable in many ways. Everybody think, looks at it and thinks, oh, well, that's all that bare ground. But then you've got to look at how thickened these soils are. 
And if it wasn't for current economics, you could be producing a lot of crops from Torrey Island. It's the, it's the economics that is the problem, not the fertility. So what we're now doing is using multivariate statistical analysis of the DNA to plot the trajectories of these islands. And we relate them to things like the population density, and in this case, the number of whiskey distilleries, which is possibly going one stage further. Um, but there's the potato famine. And the interesting thing out of the Sea of Moyle is that the two, the two islands that do best, that see least depopulation, is the richest island, Isla, and the poorest, which is Torrey. The rest are somewhere in between. Now, there may be, it's possible, and we, this is something we're searching for, that the potato famine might not have reached Torrey Island. And that's what we're, we're wondering at the moment. So the last examples I'll give you are the most difficult. And this is where we move out of nice, safe lakes or even paler channels, which are not quite as safe, into, in this case, middens. This is two sites from way up north in the Arctic Circle up here in northern Norway. There they are. One's basically Bronze Age and the other is Iron Age and Medieval. Um, so this is what's called a grassbacken site, grassbacken culture. And that is early metal age and, and medieval. And you can see there's lots of shell here and there's actually lots of shell throughout that as well. They're both middens. And what I've done here is I've put a box around the things that are in the DNA and then you can compare it to the things that are in either macrofossils or bones. So most of these sites, we picked them because they'd been excavated and they'd had a lot of archaeobotany and archaeozoology done on them. And these are all the things that get added because most of it just confirms what has been excavated, which is good. That's okay, but that's not really that interesting. Uh, this is what you add. All right, you add some plants. They tend to be the same ones when we add them because it's the north of Norway, not really surprising. We may add wheat. There's a problem over that. That has yet to be authenticated. We haven't had the shotgun sequence result of that. But we add some very other important, interesting things. Bowhead whale. Now, bowhead whale is important because you need to go, it doesn't, it's not just on the coast. It's very unlikely to be stranding. Uh, so that means this is deep sea fishing. Well, non-coastal fishing further out into the Barents Sea because they, they congregate where the ice at the ice edge, bowhead whales. Uh, we've got reindeer and we've got beaver. Beaver, as I said, keeps cropping up. It's probably going to be one day overrepresented in our data because it lives in water and dies in water and breeds in water, et cetera. But we also get some, uh, some bird, well, ptarmigan, not terribly surprising, and also right down to sea urchin. And that allows us basically to alter, to add to the species mix that we get from the site. And the reason that I want to do this particularly is that this has always limited what, what uh, nutritional modeling. Nutritional modeling, has to have a complete set of the nutrient potential nutrient intakes or near as possible. And you can't just do that and let, if you've only got bone or if only, in most cases, you often only got bone, you may have, of course, plants as well. But then again, there's a lot that's not contained even within um, uh, plant macrofossils. This is from the other site. This is from Finners. And you can see that we add the same plants. Basically, we add cattle, we add beaver, uh, it is probably one of the most northerly places that had cattle in the world. There has been evidence of that before, so that's not totally new. And that's how we then alter the, 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 the species uh, of, from the site. Right, the last couple of minutes, a few minutes, I want to spend talking about a project which is, which is m the most hairy, if you like, because middens, okay, I think middens are all right. I think we'll be okay with middens. I think they're not going to, but... Once you get to, to soils and, and terrace soils, then clearly you've got problems of, of mixing and uh, potentially of, of the mobility of DNA within a sequence. So uh, we have uh, basically the idea though, for applying this to terraces was that the deepest soils in terraces should be cumulative. And in cumulative soils, you have got a sort of pseudo stratigraphy. The bottom is older and the top is younger. So at least you have that. So that's why we've been applying them to terraces. Also, somebody, a Frenchman who's actually in our, in at Tromso, had applied it to a terrace in the French Alps and shown that you could get DNA that was 100 years old in, in uh, 2012. So we have a feel, we had a, a good idea that terraces might, might, possibly might work. 
but we didn't realize they would work quite as well as they did. Now, I, we are not going to spend a lot of time looking at some of this data, but this is what basically spills out. That's actually been processed massively. Um, it's not the original data, but that's been massively processed. But what we have here is species on the all the way down, and then that's one pit and a transect, that's the second pit, that's the third pit, etc. And these are these pits that go one, five, four out of sequence. Now, we have potatoes here, we have wheat, we have oats. But interestingly enough, not in all of the terrace, in the terraces, there's one pit per terrace basically here. So if we look at where it's not, that's most interesting. These two terraces, BJ3 and BJ4, they don't have any, they don't have any domesticates in them. Right? They don't really have any cultivars in them either. And look at the soils, right? That's the soil for that one, and that's the soil for that one. Now, you don't need to be a genius in podology to work out or to know that those are podzolic soils. Right? These two are podzolic soils, and these are not. These are agricultural loam soils. That's because these haven't been cultivated. And the reason for that is that it's too stony in that part of the terrace sequence. So these are uncultivated, and they don't have the DNA of the domesticates and the cultivars. So that is... Uh, but they um, and they they also actually have a slightly different worm uh, um, composition as well. So that's cultivated, 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 and cultivated, and those two are not. So that's a sort of intrinsic test again. And you can see, well, the, the worm different. The question is is uh, is important for us is that we don't have lumb Lumbricus terrestris at this site. That's the common earthworm, and that's the major cause of of grief. For the DNA in, in agricultural soils. This farm is also interesting because it was owned by Nidaros Cathedral, it's, uh, it's, uh, which is the most world's most northerly stone cathedral. Um, and it, uh, it was also recorded in Aslak Bolt's cadastra of uh, 1433. Um, so we know a lot about it. We know a tremendous amount about its history. It's, it's about the heights, it's at the level of the Lofoten Isles, it's on a south facing slope. And we can see that we've got our cattle and our grains. We've got some dating, and it looks like the terraces seem to be 18th century. They may be a bit older than that, but they seem to be 18th, quite late in the series. So actually later than most of the most of the all of this early evidence that we have from the site. We also actually have potato too low. Now the problem here is that potato has roots and they go down into the soil. So you're always going to have a problem with a root crop in terms of its distribution uh, in the soil. We have also been working in Belgium, and here we have a site, and on this site, we can say that we've had hops, walnuts, vines, barley, beet, peas, wheat, buckwheat, potatoes, and we get different crops on different terraces. So if we could only really date them, and in fact, the big problem we could go back to with these terraces is actually dating, and we, we, do a lot, we throw a lot of OSL at it, but that doesn't always entirely work, and a lot of char charcoal dating as well. Uh, again, these are probably, uh, well, there's a long uh, history here in Belgium, but they're probably largely late medieval and post medieval in terms of their, their use, and certainly the hops are post medieval. Viticulture. Um, I'm very interested in viticulture. I've been chasing uh, um, the British vineyards, Roman vineyards in Britain for many years. And we haven't got any DNA from a British, uh, British Roman vineyard, very, very sadly. I've tried three so far, and we haven't, we haven't succeeded. But in Italy, of course, we have. Um, so here we have some terraces which are collapsing, as you can see. And they were, they were almost certainly constructed around about 1700 for, for viticulture. But we have another site, which isn't quite as, as uh, visually appealing, from closer to the... To the um, uh, to the castle in Suave, uh, which is undoubtedly a high medieval period. So it looks like the story of the expansion of viticulture in relation to when the castle gets rebuilt in the 15th century is probably right. And we'll be chasing after that one. But uh, uh, this is Suave district. And this was very helpfully partly funded by the Suave um, Cooperative, um, Vineyard Cooperative, who, who are most hospitable. Um, and uh, we had a series of wine tastings of Suave wine. It's partly to do with the Suave Prosecco Wars, but we won't go into that. That's, that's a little bit of a, 
rather esoteric element of viticulture. But there you can see when you get vitacy, eight is the maximum, by the way. I haven't really said this, but all the hot, the color, the colors, when it's red, it's the maximum probably or near it. And when it's blue, it's low or, or empty. Um, and uh, we are very conservative about how we state our data. We state our data as the number of repeats that contain the reads of that sequence, right? So it's not the number of reads because that's an effect of the PCR process. So this is it. So eight is your maximum. That's basically what you would call saturation. We can't, we can't detect any more um, uh, vine DNA than that. And lastly, I think it's the, the last site, which is the richest of all of them, which is from a medieval site in Sicily, um, being studied by Martin Carver and, and many other and others, part of the Sicily in Transit, Transit um, uh, project, Castronovo. Uh, only one terrace, unfortunately, we'd love to have more, but unfortunately, there are these buildings on the rest of them which are in the way. But there is one terrace which has been, uh, we've been able to, to sample that's been excavated. And again, you can see this massive list, which can't really go into on the right of the data. But let's just look at a few things there. And we're starting to get things such as, for example, fig and olive, cereals, peas. The dating on this suggests that it is actually probably 12th century. The base of it is 12th century, which corresponds with the castle, really. It's the, the Christian occupation and development of Castronovo. However, there are hints of something earlier. We are trying to redate this site, actually, because we, we're not absolutely secure in the chronology. And one of them is something here, which is called bituminaria bituminosa, which I had to look up because I certainly didn't know what it was. Uh, and it's the Arabian pea, and it's from North, North Africa. So that is a little bit of hint along maybe with a fig, which was certainly there pre to the, uh, the 12th century, that there is maybe an Islamic element um, at the site of Castronovo. Um, but uh, you can see that, uh, of course, in, in most cases, we can go down to species level. There are exceptions, and, and I'm very happy to, to, to talk about those. Um, there are some groups that we can't go to species level in, um, but in most cases, we can. And then we also have, we have uh, a fairly standard, uh, what you'd expect in terms of the domestic animals that were undoubtedly kept um, on, the, uh, on the terraces as well. Right, and that basically is, is a run through um, of what we can do with SEDA DNA. And as I said, this is a, a, a team, team project. Uh, well, all this work is, is really teamwork. So we have the Southampton team at the top, which are those, uh, those young men there. Um, that's the, the Southampton contingent. And then we have a rather larger, oops, sorry, I didn't want that. Uh, we have a rather larger um, contingent at Tromso, which is where the, we have an extraction laboratory in, in Southampton, and we extract in Southampton for UK sites and, and some in Northern Europe. Uh, and then we extract for, um, uh, depending uh, Mediterranean sites, actually we've extracted in Italy and also in Southampton. But uh, the majority of the rest of the work, the PCR and the sequencing is, is, is done in Norway, but it can be done here. Um, and we also have been doing some work in in a completely different sphere, which is in, in relation to Jomon. Jomon studies in, in Japan as well, where we're starting now to apply um, sedimentary ancient DNA. And uh, so with that, um, I'd offer up for questions. Thank you ever so much, Tony. That, um, for me, this is... Uh, uh, an area that I'm sort of aware of, but you've um, very clearly uh, given us an account of um, how, how it works, where it's going, what the um, potential is, and it really is jaw dropping in the sense of uh, when you compare it with pollen and so forth. We're, we're, it's a clearly completely changed landscape. Um, we, I'll take questions from the room, and we take questions online, sort of separately in a moment. If I kick off, Tony, um, I'm right in understanding that the, the DNA is attaching to the clay minerals, basically, in the soil. But does that, mm. that presumably limits the types of soils 
um, which we can sample to get material from. I wonder if you just. In theory, yes, but but clay, even even quite sandy soils, loamy sandy loams, often contain enough clay. So um, we've been. I would I would normally say, well, if it's almost a complete sand, I think it's very unlikely to contain DNA. Uh, enough, I mean, you know, enough for us to be able to work with, to be able to amplify. Uh, but actually, there have been some soils which are certainly sandy, but they, they've got enough clay. It can be bound to silica, um, uh, because in fact, we use that as sometimes an extraction method, uh, but it's just not as efficient. So it is, in general, I would say that yes, but the vast majority of archaeological deposits and soils contain clay minerals. So it's just that the clay minerals are more efficient. And organic matter is also efficient too. So if you had organic matter, so mires and bogs contain uh, quite a lot of DNA, but the problem there is the DNA is boring because it's just the DNA of mires, what's on the mire and the bog. It doesn't tell you very much. And the key difference is the fact that the DNA can only come from the catchment. Uh, so that clay has only come from within the catchment, whereas pollen, of course, comes from outside the catchment. And that's why actually DNA will never totally replace po pollen because they have different source area. So you can say different things about different distances. It, it changes the geographical range. Yes. We can sample from. Yes. And, it, is... and it's more specific in that sense because we can, in fact, we know that the vast majority of DNA comes from a few meters around the lake or the archaeological site. Most of it is really sort of very close. Questions. If people could identify themselves, and if that's not quite clear, uh, is there a line in the middle? Hi, Samuel Lynn, I'm just a guest. Um, you mentioned that there's a technique which is used to respond to the challenge that DNA, which you find, may have come from animals which are already dead. Uh, I didn't follow the significance of that. What, what, why, why, why is that a, a problem? Well, if, if we had, for example, a pile of bones, you know, if we had a burial uh, on an island, such as a Cranach or something like that, or uh, next to a lake, then in theory, that process of decomposition will be constantly leaching out and losing DNA. So therefore, it is theoretically possible that DNA could go on coming out of that site for quite a long time as the bone collagen, actually, because first of all, there's the soft tissues, then there's the collagen in the bone, and it goes on coming out. So this was basically put forward as a problem potentially for our Cranach sites or sites where you have burials, which are close to the actual DNA sampling location. So that's why we used, um, we, we've also used steroles because they can't, they can only be produced by live, they, they come from the lining of the, of the stomach of, of animals and humans. So they can only represent live. They, they don't last within the environment until they get attached um, because that's soft tissue. They can't come from bone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's to do with leaching from bone as a potential source. Thank you for your presentation. I know nothing about this area at all. My name is Rob Burridge. I just wanted to ask you, going a little bit beyond what you've spoken about, about whether sediment can be obtained from caves to study early humans or an early human species such as Neanderthals and like. Yes. I thought that. Yes. Um, on the first diagram of some of the stars of sight, several of those are caves. In fact, it was used uh, quite early on in caves. Um, because you have both bone in caves and you have coprolites. And in fact, uh, many, uh, several sites have produced Neanderthal. And in fact, we don't, we throw away human DNA yeah? because we don't know whether it's contaminated. We don't, we don't do human DNA. Most of our sites, they have a fair bit. We've actually now got a blocker. We now block human DNA um, in the laboratory because otherwise it, it, we don't want to amplify it. But of course, if you have Neanderthal DNA, that's different, and we recognize that. So uh, this has not been a big problem in Scandinavia, but uh, once you move into West, a case such as Troll West in Belgium, 
That's, a, that's the, the Neanderthal at Troll West is only known from DNA. Um, so yes, uh, and that will that is the, one of the massive areas. Mostly that's probably DNA from bone though. And in caves, the DNA is coming from bone. Uh, so that's the other area, largely that's uh, cellular DNA. But yeah, that's a major, that's what Max Planck and Sventi Parvo, uh, the whole of their career is that. And that's in a way, uh, many of the techniques that we use were pioneered by that laboratory and by their work. Um, but they are technically doing human, they're doing human or hominin DNA. Uh, Rowena Banerjee. Um, I just wondered what uh, DNA database you use for Sicily and if it would be um, applicable for other areas of the Mediterranean. Yes, we, we have to use something called EMBL which is there, there, is, um, there are global databases for plants. And actually for Northern Europe, they're, not, they're actually pretty good. So the Mediterranean, I should think, you've probably got about seven, eight, no, probably 80 or 90% of the common species would be in either EMBL, that's the global one, or Philo, Philo Alps, our Philo Alps will contain most of them actually. As you get more to the tropics, the problems get, it gets far worse. So if you try to go um, into tropical areas, you would find that you might only be able to match 50 or 60% of your reads. We have a statistic all the time, which is the number of reads that we can't assign. Okay. Now there are various reasons for that. It might be because there are swaps of some, you get these, these things called homopolymer swaps where they're just wrong, the sequence, because there's been a swapping um, between bases. Uh, and there are other reasons as well. But um, generally, we can identify the vast majority using the P6 loop. Uh, but for plants in the Mediterranean at the moment, we use three databases. So all of this one, the last one, that has been that one there, that uses three databases. It runs through Philo Norway, then it runs through Philo Alps, then it runs through AEMBL, and we check how much, how similar they are. Uh, so for example, the Arabian P, that's not in Philo Alps and that's not in Philo Norway. When I first started working in Norway, we had, we had a problem actually, because I took sites from Britain and our pipeline was designed to throw out all the things that weren't Scandinavian. So for example, I suddenly realized that we had to change the pipeline and we had to alter it because it was throwing out potato, which is not good if you're looking at Irish sites. So in the post-medieval period. So yeah, it. it so, but it, there is, there's the EMBL. So I think that um, Castronovo shows that you can get the vast majority. I can't imagine there's much on that site that, is not, that we've not identified in the DNA, but I could give you the number of ident unidentified reads. Yeah, so um, there is a project in Britain, um, which is being done at the Sanger Institute actually to, to geno skim all the British flora. That will help quite a bit. It's being run really from the Botanic Garden at Edinburgh but the actual work is being done at Cambridge. And then we will run our data through that as well. But I doubt it will, it'll add a few, maybe a few species, but not many. Yeah. Thank you, that was a fascinating talk. Um, Pat Randolph Quinney from Northumbria University. Um, go back to caves again. Yes. Um, I'd be very interested uh, your opinion on the possibility or, or, or future directions in getting cellular DNA out of speleothermes, glowstones as well as stalactites. There is no theoretical problem because we know that calcite binds very well to DNA. In fact, um, so for example, we're doing a bit of work on on tooth calculus, which is the same stuff, really. <laughs> sort of. Um, uh, so there's no problem. Uh, the two problems I or the points I see is that. First of all, it will be at quite a low concentration, but okay, we can probably get around that by using bigger samples. Um, then you're also talking about probably almost entirely plant DNA because it's what's come down from above. So it's a little bit like pollen in, in speleothems. It can be done, but I'm not quite sure what it will tell you. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, we have, in fact, last summer, we were doing some, we were, we were sampling some of Daniel Shreve's caves in, in uh, the Mendips. And uh, in the sediment near the entrance, then we get quite good DNA from the environment around. 
plus the animals that are in. But I don't think the speed, I suppose if it's a ground, if it's on the, if it's a style which is a, a flow floor, then you might get the animal, you might get the animals, but you're probably, probably going to get that if you've got the bones anyway. So They're I'm actually interested in, in, in mm. the, the flora. Um, so, and I work in Southern African caves, um, where basically your paleo environmental signature is, is what dead animals are in that cave. Yes, um, yes. So, so, you know. Yeah, I, th I think it, it, yeah. it should be. I mean, it'll be a little bit more challenging because the amount of DNA will be quite low. The template, what's called template DNA, which is the, in, the DNA that's in the environment that you're sampling, might be relatively low, especially if it's a semi arid environment, too. So, but in theory, it is possible. Yes, you. you can do it. Can you use uh, bags of soil samples from previous excavations, or do you need to sample on site specifically for analysis? Well, the, the official answer to that question is no, we can't. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, we, we do spend, I haven't, I've not shown you lots of pictures of us taking samples, but we do obviously have protocols, which means that we're trying to absolutely minimize or prevent any contamination. So uh, ideally, we like new, fresh. Actually, we even prefer cores to to excavations in lots of ways, e even for for ground sites, for terrestrial sites. Uh, so in theory, the answer is no. However, there are we know it is possible, and there are ways of 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 sorting out the contamination. So if it's really important enough, and if it, the aggregates have held together, and if it's been kept dark and it's been kept cold or it's completely desiccated, then it is possible. You can do it, but the question will be, um, is it actually worthwhile? I have a PhD student at the moment who is actually investigating this because we have soil samples in our museum, which are 40, 50 years old from excavations, which just don't exist anymore. So we are looking at how we can use old samples that might be archived. Uh, we know you can. Um, some of our cores are horribly old, actually. I think the, I think we've used cores which are up to about 20 years old or so. So, um, yeah, and if it's been stored reasonably, um, so the practical answer, the, the official answer is no, but in practice, yes, you probably can. You said that you look at stannels. Do you look at plant wax biomarkers together with the SEDA DNA? Uh, we've done a little bit of that. That's mostly another part. In Tromso, we have a project on leaf waxes. And so um, we've done some work on lakes. Um, we've particularly done this in, in Svalbard in, in Spitsbergen, where we're comparing the leaf wax record to our DNA record. But the leaf wax record, its only value, it seems to me, is climatic. It's a paleoclimate indicator. That's really what it is. And I don't think that DNA is particularly any better at that than, for example, pollen is, really. It, it may be a bit better because we can be at the species level. And we, so um, we can use trait databases, we can use, uh, which is, gives us temperature, and then we can relate that to, uh, to, for example, leaf waxes. I'm more interested in fecal stanols and bile acids because those directly relate to human activity. But I mean, that's, uh, I mean, it's all molecular chemistry. We don't do that in-house. Um, my um, uh, bile acids and stanols work has been done either at Newcastle um, uh, or somewhere else, which I've forgotten now. Oh, um, yes, um, uh, BGS. Do different types of clay mineral affect preservation of DNA? Again, in theory, yes. In practice, we have yet to prove it, show it. Theoretically, it, they should do, because if you think of different clay minerals, like clay minerals are all sandwiches, aren't they? They're all sandwiches between a, an aluminium and silica, right, with something in between. So if, for example, that something in between is water, in theory, um, structural water, then DNA can go into that. So that's monmorillonites, for example, et cetera. So the cation exchange capacity, which is a pretty good old fashioned measure of the, of the attractability uh, to most organic molecules, um, varies uh, for different clay minerals uh, to some extent. They're all massively higher than quartz and other things. So, uh, so in theory, it might be, but in practice, I think uh, we just see that basically clay, uh, the clay mineral um, 
percentage even is probably quite a good proxy, really. Um, but we, we're having problems. Um, that we've got several, two projects looking at taphonomy, trying to work out exactly what the processes of holding on to the, to the, to the DNA is. Because organic matter has a nonlinear relationship to DNA. So where we get very high organic matters, we often have less DNA, which is a bit counterintuitive. And the reason for that is that it's dominated then by things like algae. And then, so, and, and our primer is designed not to get too much algae. We do get algae. Uh, and in fact, we've got so much algae, we've started to, to look at subspecies um, uh, variation in algae, just because we got too much of it. We're looking for mammoths on one side and we got algae. So it's not quite as exciting as mammoths, but theoretically it's more interesting because um, we're starting now to go below the species level. And that's something I haven't mentioned, but that is another massive step. If you can start to go below species level for sediment DNA, you can start to look at where crops, for example, have come from, because you can do the same thing as you can do on archaeobotanical specimens. You can start to look at, at uh, their, basically their genetics and their haplotypes and their haplogroups. So in theory, you can go below the species level. And often in several sites I've shown you, we have more than one sequence, but for example, Pig, pig is a problem uh, because we've got several pig sequences and that's probably because we have both the wild pig, which is interbreeding with pigs that have come in from uh, um, Southeastern Europe. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's drifted off from your clay question. <laughs> uh, have you analyzed DNA from any shell middens or Mesolithic site types? Yes. Uh, the site two back was a shell midden. That was a Bronze Age shell midden. But at the moment, where well, I have a project which is doing precisely that, <laughs> uh, we're going up to a site, two sites this, this coming summer. We have sites in southern, southern England as well. I think shell middens are very potentially very good. That, that site up at, at, um, in the Varanga Peninsula at uh, the Grassbacken site shows that, that shell middens will work. There is potentially a bigger contamination problem. So, but that's when we have to look at authentication. So, but I think uh, shell middens are definitely a really potentially good size. We use, to, we need to use different markers because at the moment we don't use markers that are very good for, um, for shells, but of course the shells aren't the interesting bit because you know what the shells are, you can tell them. What's interesting is the fish and the mammals and the plants. So yeah, but shell middens, yes. I think they're the, the next easy, site type to deal with. Uh, last question, how can you be sure you are not dealing with the remains of roots from plants growing later up the sequence? Yes, that's where you come down to the authentication. If, they, it's, if it's modern root contamination, then you would find that that didn't have damage patterns. So the damage patterns show that it can't be modern root contamination. But if and, and of course, most of our sites, we do really prefer lakes and water bodies so that we don't have rootlets. But as soon as you move into soils, that is a problem and it will cause a blurring even in a cumulative soil because you've got that root depth. So you will have to, you will get DNA of the same age in that root depth. So it depends on the site. But in theory, intrinsic authentication can sort that out. But Shotgun sequencing is rather expensive and there's a lot of work involved. So we try to find as many ways possibly of going around the problem rather than having to use shotgun sequencing for authentication. It's a problem potentially in Myers as well, particularly. Tony, uh, you've given us a, a fantastic talk. Um, I always aware that these um, new techniques come in and we um, sort of become aware of them and then we're at the stage now where we're really seeing the potential of this coming through and it's a great pleasure to have heard you as one of the pioneers in the area um, uh, speaking and presenting on this this evening so can we um, express our thanks again uh, to you for your, for your lecture thank you Um, 
I give notice that the next meeting will be on Thursday the 20th of April when we will hear a paper, Who Hit the Cheapside Hoard, Goldsmith's Row Mystery Resolved by Dr. Rosemary Weinstein uh, Fellow. The meeting stands.